All right, thank you. And uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to 10 human behavior hacks that will change the way you create email. So can people hear me all right? We good? All right, excellent. So today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about 10 practical, actionable tactics that you can use on top of your email best practices in order to increase your open read and response rates. We're going to cover words that work like magic in subject lines, two ways to position your message for fast response, the ripple effect of the consistency principle, why you'll sell more using social proof, when negative can deliver positive results, how availability bias turns doubters into buyers, what instantly makes you look better than the competition, the one thing to say to increase response, the journalist's secret that boosts email readership, and which days are best for success. And this is not going to be what you think. So does this sound good? Excellent, because that's what I've prepared. OK, so before we start, there's one thing that you need to know, and that is, Everyone relies on decision-making shortcuts. What are decision-making shortcuts? There's certain automatic, instinctive, reflexive behaviors. Humans have developed these over the millennia as a way to conserve mental energy, because we couldn't possibly weigh every bit of information before making a decision, or we'd never get around to making any. So we've developed these hardwired decision defaults. We kind of cruise along on autopilot, and when we encounter a, a certain situation or what a researcher would call a stimulus, we just default to these hardwired behaviors, giving them little to no thought. It would be as if I sneezed and you said, bless you, or gesundheit. You wouldn't really think about it. You would just respond. And social scientists have documented dozens and dozens and dozens of these automatic behaviors. And some of them influence what we read, who we trust, when we buy. And that's why they're so important to us as email marketers. So the first human behavior hack that I want to share with you is words that work like magic in subject lines. Now, we're going to get to the like magic portion in just a second. The first point I want to make is words work in subject lines. Words work in subject lines, so choose yours carefully and then use them. Don't do this. Here we have a fabulous restaurant with a fabulous deal. And what does the subject line say? Enter subject line here. Don't do this, OK? People are going to see this and think spam, or at the very least, they're going to think, you know what? If they can't be bothered to actually write the subject line, I can't be bothered to read the email. Not a good thing. And you would be surprised how often this happens. This is my favorite. You have to indulge me. This is for a, a class on practical applications of mindfulness in daily life. <laughs> yeah. Somebody needs to take that class. OK, so I'm, I'm talking a lot about subject lines because they drive opening rates. You have your sender and your subject line. And those two things determine whether or not someone is going to open your email. And I actually think people put more emphasis on subject lines, although there are other people who disagree with me. But I feel people uh, spend more time looking at subject lines and determining whether or not they should open an email based on that. Regardless, you should keep your subject lines at about 35 characters. It's relatively short, but it's because about 64% of email first opens happen on mobile devices these days. So you have that much less real estate to convey your message. So you want to keep your subject line short. If not, what can happen is you might end up inadvertently communicating something that you didn't mean to communicate. For example, here we have a daily recipe site. And their subject line says, here are 50 genius ways to cook pot. It's good. I, you, opening rate skyrocketed in some states, right? Uh, but then they find out how to cook french fries or something. It's like, ah, disappointment. Um, and, you know, and, and this happens, too. Here's another example. This is from Gartner. Exclusive presentation on marketing something. Probably not ASS. So, uh, so try to keep those subject lines short. So now let's get back to the like magic portion, words that work like magic in subject lines. Well, the words that work like magic in subject lines are eye magnet words. Eye magnet words are words that attract the human eye. So think about it. When we write. We write in a very linear fashion. One word, followed by the next, followed by the next. But that's not how we read. When we read, we skim and scan. And if something happens to capture our attention, we, we dive back in and we actually read. We consume the message, the email. So you want to use eye magnet words in your subject lines. You want to use these words that are going to pull the human eye in. So let's take a look at five of them. One of them is the word new. According to CopyBlogger, new is one of the top five most persuasive words in the English language. And there's a very good reason for it. 
science has shown that the human brain craves novelty. The human brain craves news and novelty. And the reason the brain craves it is because when we find something that's new or novel, it activates the pleasure center in our brains. And as you might imagine, that feels good. So we spend time looking for something new. And when we find something new, it feels good. And then what do we do? We look for the next new thing, because we want to keep activating that pleasure center. So you can use the word new, or the entire family of new words in your subject lines. New, now, introducing, announcing, finally, soon, discover. These all hold out the promise of a reward, the, the promise that the pleasure center will be activated by finding something new or novel. So use them. Next eye magnet word is free. Now there was a time when you would absolutely never use free in your subject lines, because it would trigger the spam filters. That's not always the case these days. As a matter of fact, World Data ran a study on the subject lines that performed best, or the, I should sorry, the words that performed best in subject lines. And last year and this year, free was towards the top of that list. Sidekick ran a study, and they found you can get 10% lift in opening rates when you use the word free. So free is definitely something worth testing. Here's the scientific reason why it works so well. There's a behavioral economist, his name is Dan Ariely. You might know him from the New York Times best-selling book he wrote called Predictably Irrational. In that book, he devotes an entire chapter to the pulling power of the word free. What he says is free gives us such an emotional charge that we place far more value on the free thing than it's really worth. And think about this. You've probably been down on the exhibit floor, walking around from booth to booth, and what are you doing? You're grabbing those t-shirts and those pens and those mugs and uh, the stress toys, right? We're all doing it. Now imagine if there was a little sign that said 50 cents or 25 cents. You'd probably walk right by, right? And be like, I don't want one of those. That's not even my company's name on it, right? But if it's free, oh my gosh, we want it. So free can be a very powerful psychological pull. Our next eye magnet word is your name or more importantly, your target's name. Okay? We all love our own names. Experian ran a study. They found you can get a 29.3% lift in your opening rate if you personalize the subject line. And the reason is something called the principle of liking. Social scientists have found that we think more favorably, more kindly, we place more value on things that remind us of ourselves. And what reminds us of ourselves more than our names? Our names are very dear to us. Today at the co conference, I'm sure you're going to be chatting with somebody at one point, and there's just going to be a bunch of background noise until somebody in that background mentions your name. And all you hear is nothing mumble, 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 nothing until your name, and then your ears perk right up. Same thing with your eyes, skimming and scanning, skimming and scanning, and when they see your name, they go right to it. So personalization is great. Now, if you're in email marketing, you know how effective personalization can be, and you know it doesn't stop with people's names. You can use other demographic data, or psychographic data, or past purchase data, or self-reported data. One word of caution. Just because you have the data doesn't necessarily mean you should use it. Let me give you an example. I shop from time to time at Living Social, so I was very excited to get this email. Right? They say, we've picked this just for you. Elizabeth Arden, we're not kidding, exclamation point. Well, actually, I'm very excited. Like, all right, what did they choose for me? So I opened the email only to find that what they chose just for me was Elizabeth Arden anti-aging serum. <laughs> Seriously? Come on. So just because you had the data doesn't mean that you should use it. But personalizing a subject line definitely will get you a lift in opening rates. All right, our fourth of the five eye magnet words that I want to share with you is the word secret. World data found you get an 11% lift in opening rates simply by including that word in your subject line. The reason is social scientists have found that people are more persuaded by information they feel isn't readily available. So we're more persuaded by information we feel isn't readily available. So there are several different ways that you can convey that. You can talk about the inside story, a sneak peek, confessions of. Those are all great ways to convey that you have information that's not readily available. Secret is a fabulous way because it's a short, succinct word, and we know it will get an 11% lift in opening rates. Final word is the word alert. According to Adestra, it will increase your opening rates by 33.1%. And here's the reason why. Human beings are hardwired to watch out for danger, to be on the lookout for threats. And when we see the word alert, it signals to us, it telegraphs to us that we should pay attention, that there might be danger, that there might be some potential threat. So we focus all of our attention. So very good word to use. 
All right, our second, oh, sorry, our action word. Front load those eye magnet words. Use those eye magnet words in your subject lines and put them at the beginning so you don't risk them being cut off if someone's reading on a, a tablet or a mobile device. All right, our second human behavior hack, two ways to position your message for fast response. So we're in email marketing, obviously we want response, but we now want response fast because we know that if that email drops down to the bottom of the list and disappears, there's a very good likelihood people aren't going to return to it. Even if they thought they might, there's a very good likelihood they won't. So we want to get people to respond as soon as they see the email. And there are two ways that you can do that. Both of them revolve around the principle of scarcity. So what social scientists have found is if something is readily available, we may or may not be interested. If we're interested, we take advantage of it. If we're not, we don't. It's that simple. But just let someone know that that something is only available for a certain amount of time, or it's only available to a certain group of people, and that changes everything. Suddenly we want it, and we want it badly. And those are the two halves of the scarcity principle. Urgency, only available for a certain amount of time or in certain quantities, and exclusivity, only available to a certain group of people. So let's look at how we can use that in our email marketing. You can use a countdown clock. According to world data, you can get a 17% increase in your click-through rates with a countdown clock. You're just seeing those numbers continually, uh, continually changing, and it just underscores urgency, and you feel that urgency, and you feel like you've got to get moving quickly. Or here's another great example. This one oozes urgency. How many of you guys have the Taylor Swift squirrel pajamas? <laughs> Thank you. I was so afraid I was going to be alone up here on this one. Thank you. So I, I love this example because Taylor is oozing urgency here. So the subject line basically says daily deal. So right away you know there's urgency. Then she says, wow, supplies last. Sale ends tonight at 11.59. Today only. And she, she does a wonderful job of changing the question. She, she leapfrogs over the question of do I or do I not want squirrel pajamas and gets all the way quickly to, oh my god, can I get these in my size before they're sold out? Right? It just totally changes the question because she's got so much urgency going on. Here's another good example of urgency. I'm holding one of the last 15 seats for you. Please RSVP today. Like, wow, you haven't even opened the email yet and you're already starting to think, oh my gosh, you've got to get going. Or here's one. This one combines both sides of scarcity, urgency as well as exclusivity. It says, last chance to join Expedia Rewards before the public launch. So your last chance is urgency. Before the public launch, well, that's the exclusivity, right? It's like, turns out you can get in later, but you can get in with everyone else, and who wants to do that, right? You want to be part of that exclusive group. Here's another example of exclusivity. Be a founding donor of the Stop Trump Fund. So it's not a donor, it's a founding donor. It's like being a VIP or a charter member. It's a very exclusive group and apparently a small one. Um, here, here we have the International Association of Privacy Professionals, and their subject line reads, new credential just for CIPP certified pros. So if you get that, you realize that not everybody in the International Association of Privacy Professionals is getting this. It's only people with the credential that you happen to have. It's a small select group, a, a, an exclusive group, and that way you feel like it's more targeted to you, more relevant to you. And finally, we have you should have, uh, I'm sorry, you have been selected for your expertise. Now, can you imagine skimming your email box and having that subject line jump out at you? I mean, we all think that we're smarter than the average bear, better than the average bear. So you see something like that and you think, yeah, well, clearly they're aware of my expertise. This is awesome. What do they have to say? So good use of ex exclusivity. So what you want to do is you want to make people feel special or you want to make them feel time pressed or both. But that's how you use the, exclusive, uh, the scarcity principle. Our third hack is the ripple effect of the consistency principle. And this is kind of interesting. What social scientists have found is once someone makes a decision or takes a stand, they like to remain consistent with it when future opportunities arise. And they do this without giving it a lot of thought. So what does this mean to email marketers? It means that if we can get somebody to say yes to us once, we're much more likely to get a second yes, a third yes, a fourth yes. This is particularly true if our first ask is relatively small and if the answer is somehow public. So once people remain consistent, once people commit, they remain consistent. First small yes leads to subsequent larger ones. This is actually one of Robert Cialdini's six principles of persuasion. How do we use it? Well, here we have Semper International. And right in the subject line, they say, thanks for your ongoing support. Want to help out again? So they're reminding me 
You've done business with me in the past. You've said yes before. So I don't have to evaluate this from square one. I just go, yeah, right. Consistent with, with previous actions, consistent with how I view myself, I'll just say yes again. The decision-making shortcut clicks right in. Or here we have something from Amtrak. And they say, listen, you've already registered. And since you have, now all you have to do is travel. So they sent an earlier email saying, during a promotion period, you can join double points, but only if you enroll. You have to sign up now. So then anyone who signed up got this email when the promotion period actually arrived. And they said, hey, listen, you intended to, to do this. Now take advantage of it. Buy the ticket. Delta. They're offering a 30-day Delta Sky Club membership for just $90. And the reason they're doing that is anyone who takes that 30-day one, at the end of the 30 days, Delta's going to come back and say, now how about a year-long membership? And they know they're much more likely to get a yes out of someone who did the trial membership first. Another example from politics. I've got a few political examples in here, only because um, the politicians really use a lot of behavioral economics, and they use it well. Uh, Barack Obama actually signed at the end of last year an executive order instructing the various government agencies to tap into the work of behavioral economists because it's so powerful. So here's an example. It's an email that went out, and they said, would you take a one-question survey? And you think, sure, one-question survey sounds easy. I'll do it. Two to the word, single question. You answer the question. You hit submit. The thank you page comes up. How about making a donation? Put your money where your mouth is. They knew that for at least a segment of people, this would be more effective than a single email that said, how about making a donation? What they wanted to do was activate that cascade of yeses. Yes, I'll open the email. Yes, I'll agree to take the survey. Yes, I'll submit my survey answer. And now, hopefully, they're thinking, now, yes, I'll make a donation. So get that cascade of yeses. Escalate your asks, larger and larger each time and remind people of their earlier yes. Remind them that they already said yes so the decision-making shortcut clicks in. Fourth human behavior hack, why you'll sell more using social proof. So these days, we want to sell. We want to sell as, as much as we can, right? We want to sell more. So this is how it works. Social scientists have found that when we're uncertain of what to do, we look to others and we follow their lead. So we do what other, people's do, other people's, oh, we do, what other people do, especially if they're like us. As a matter of fact, the Journal of Applied uh, Psychology ran a study. And uh, they reported on the study, actually. There were two researchers from North Carolina. And these researchers posed as solicitors for a charity. And they were going door to door. And they were asking people to donate to this fictitious charity. So they'd go up to the door. They'd ring the doorbell. The person would come to the door. They would describe the fictitious charity. They would ask for a donation. And they would display the list of people who had already donated. What they found was the longer that list was, the more likely the person in front of them would be to donate. Okay? Imagine you're the, the person who owns the house. You, your doorbell rings. You come to the front door. There's two guys there that you've never seen before. They're describing a charity, which you know sounds nice, but you've never heard of it. You couldn't because it was fictitious. And then they say, well, you know, here's the other people who have donated. Would you please make a donation? And you make that split-second decision. Right? It's a decision-making shortcut. Looks like a lot of people have. I guess I will, too. Or, gee, there's not many names on that list. I don't think I'm going to. So, very powerful decision-making shortcut. How do we use it in email marketing? Well, here's Hillary. She said, 347 people in my area have donated. Not 347 people in my state, not in the nation, not in the party, in my area. Join right now. Now, just to show that I am a bipartisan conference presenter, we have the Trump campaign, also using social proof. He said, I've already heard from several folks in your community. Don't be the only supporter in your neighborhood without a sign. So heavy social proof in both cases. Here we've got your marketing peers' top downloads from the first half of 2016. And you think, oh, that's awesome. I can't keep track of everything I should be downloading and consuming. But here are the, my peers, and this is the top stuff they've done. I'll pay attention to this. This is a great example of social proof exerted on me and then me turning around and exerting it on someone else. This is um, the Direct Exchange Conference. And they said, hey, see who's coming to Direct Exchange and invite your colleagues. So I check. I see who's going. And I'm like, wow, I, I know some people, or I, know some, I recognize some agencies, or at the very least, I see people whose titles are similar to mine, and I think, those are my people. I should be there. And then I turn around, and I send this email to colleagues of mine, and they think, gee, Nancy's going, and we have similar jobs. Maybe I should go, too. So a nice example of social proof on me, and then turned around and exerted on people that I know. If anyone ever shopped at Beyond the Rack, you know what a great deal that is, right? So I get an email, and they're having a sale on coach bags. And who can't use another coach bag? I'm like, oh, awesome. So I go, and there's four of them. But as you can see, there's really only three available to me, because the one there on the left was reserved by others. So which one did I want? Of course, I want the one everyone else has, right? 
Uh, but they did, they did tell me that I could check back in 12 minutes. And you know if one became available in 12 minutes, I'd jump on it so I could have the handbag everyone else had. I want what everyone else has. It's the social proof example. So in your emails, show your target that others have already done what you're asking them to do. Fifth human behavior hack, when negative can deliver positive results. So we're all in marketing, and this is going to sound a little counterintuitive to us, because in marketing, it's all about the benefits, right? We're asking people to do something, and we tell them all the wonderful things that will happen if they do. You know, this is, this is all the great things that will happen if you buy my product, if you sign up for my service, if you download my white paper, whatever it is. And that's fine, except social scientists have found that people are twice as motivated to avoid pain as they are to achieve pleasure. Twice as motivated to avoid pain and loss as we are to achieve pleasure and gain. So I would never suggest that we walk away from benefits. Benefits are very important and they work, but sometimes a little well-placed loss aversion can go a long way. So instead of talking about what people will gain if they do what you're asking them to do, tell them what will happen if they don't do what you're asking them to do, or tell them about the horrible stuff they can avoid if they do what you're asking them to do. So here we've got Hewlett Packard, and they say you have no idea what you've missed. Now, they could have talked about all the wonderful stuff that was coming ahead, but instead, they looked back and said, you have no idea what you missed because you weren't part of us. Or here we have Jay Peterman, and they say, if you're holding out for this stuff to go on sale, don't. It probably won't be around that long, which I think is brilliant. You know, sometimes you see something, like, gee, that's kind of cool. I think I'll wait and see if it goes on sale. And they're saying, if, you know, if you're thinking that, forget it, buddy. It's probably not going to last. Even if you weren't thinking that, you might go, gosh, I better buy one of these. It sounds like they're going to be very popular. Seven emails you should never send. Now, the positive version of that would, of course, be seven emails you should always send. And that would be great, and we would want to know that. But what we really want to know is the seven we shouldn't send. It would be as if I said to you guys, hey, you're going out for dinner tonight? I'm from Boston. I'll tell you the best restaurant to go to. That'd be pretty good, right? But if I said, you guys are going out for dinner tonight? I'm from Boston. Let me tell you the one place you should not go to. You'd really want that information. We want to avoid the pain, the loss, the mistakes. Inbound. Inbound did a fabulous example. They said, don't pay extra, don't pay an extra $300 for inbound. Now they could have said save an extra 100 or save an extra 300, but they flipped it. Don't pay an extra, uh, extra 300. And you're like, yeah, I don't want to pay more than I have to. And then finally, kiss metrics. Why your conversions suck and how to fix it. And this is very important. Don't just tell people what they're doing wrong. Hold out the hope that you can solve it. Because if you tell people, oh, you're, you know, you're doing this all wrong, they might just feel defeated and think, ah, that's it, I'm just going to walk away from it. By pointing out that there's a problem, but that you've also got the solution, that's what pulls people in. So help people avoid mistakes. We're all very motivated to avoid mistakes. We're twice as motivated to avoid pain as we are to achieve gain. Our sixth human behavior hack, how availability bias turns doubters into buyers. So most of the people that we're emailing are doubters. They don't always believe what we as marketers have to say. They're skeptical. Are we telling the truth as marketers? Is you know, what we're saying really true? Are the claims we're making really true? Is it worth their time and effort to find out? Is it worth the extra money? Is it worth the effort to switch from one service or, or company to another? They're, they're skeptical. Availability bias can work on this. So here's how availability bias works. People will decide the likelihood of an event happening based on how readily they can recall an example. So uh, it, you know, when people are asked, do a lot of passengers die in plane crashes, we think, yeah, because we think about all the, the TV news stories we've heard about plane crashes and how they usually involve fatalities. That's the information that's available to us. And so we say yes. And it's because the news doesn't report on the millions and millions and millions of safe landings. It just doesn't. So people will determine the likelihood of an event happening. And in this case, the event would be whether or not they need what it is you're asking them to do, what it is you're selling. They'll determine whether or not they need it based on how readily they can recall an example. It's all about personal relevance. People think if it can be recalled or imagined, then it's more likely to happen. I'm more likely to need it. Let me show you some, some email examples. This is an email that I received from Sharper Image. And I know you guys don't know me very well, so take my word for it when I say I am not a hand crank kind of gal, okay? They're trying to sell a weather alert emergency hand crank radio, and I think batteries were invented for a reason, right? So normally I would not give uh, an email like this a second glance. However, the night before, I was watching the news, and it was filled with stories of this storm that was blowing through the area. 
and people were losing power left and right. And I went to bed that night. That was the last thing I saw. Woke up the next morning. Fortunately, we still had power. I turned on my computer. I started to go through my emails, and I saw this one. And suddenly I thought, wow, maybe I do need an emergency weather alert hand crank radio. I could, I could see how it would fit in. Here's another example. This is from politics. When Barack Obama was trying to get reelected, he sent out an email. This was at the bottom of it. At the top of it, he was asking people to make a donation by midnight tonight. If they donated by midnight that night, they would be entered to win dinner with him. And you think, oh, all the people that are going to be donating, what is the likelihood? And then you look at that. You get to that image, and you're like, oh, wow. It's going to be a round table, not one of those really long, rectangular ones. There's only going to be eight of us. I'll be to his right. My guests will be to his left. You could see it. You could envision it. You could imagine it. It became very real, and it worked very well for him. Boston Globe was trying to get people to buy gift subscriptions to bostonglobe.com. So they said, hey, it's an incredible gift for you. And then they listed 10 different descriptors. Your avid reader, your political junkie, your sports fan, your travel buff. And what happened is each, you know, as, as people were reading that, they began to think of the people that they knew. It's like, oh, well, my husband's an avid reader. My father-in-law's a political junkie. My son away at college is a sports fan. Uh, you know, my college roommate is a, a travel buff, but you begin to slot in the people that you know. And by the time you finish, you've got 10 potential people you could give this gift to. Well, here we've got availability bias happening right in the subject line. It says, win a Vegas bachelorette bash for four. Who will you take? And you think, oh my god, I have six bridesmaids. Which two am I going to dump, right? So our action item, stir people's memories or their imaginations before you ask them to respond. Get them to think of a time in the past when they could have used your product or service, or imagine a time in the future when it would fit into their lives, and then make your ask. Seventh human behavior hack of the 10. What instantly makes you look better than the competition? So these days, it's really hard to stand out. Most of us have competitors that are either doing exactly what we do or doing something very, very similar. So it's tough to, to make ourselves stand out, but there is a way to do it, and that is by invoking the authority principle. Ever since we were children, we have been taught to recognize and respect authority. So by the time we're adults, it's ingrained in us. We just accept what the authorities say. We rarely question them. We just figure, OK, that's what the authority says. Particularly if the authority happens to be a subject matter expert, we assume, hey, look, they've done the legwork. This is their job. They know it inside and out. I'm just going to go with what they say. So here's how you use that in email marketing. Here you know, you've got a Connecticut Inn, and this one has the AAA five star. So if you were looking for an inn in Connecticut, this would bubble right to the top of your list because, hey, AAA already gave them five stars. They know what they're talking about. This is their business. Or if you were trying to find a closet organizer, a very tedious job. So who wants to go through all that comparison when Consumer Reports and Smart Shop Magazine both say that this one is the best of the bunch? Great, my job is done, right? Bubbles right up to the top, makes, makes this particular one look better than the competition. Now here's something interesting. When we talk about authorities, what we're talking about is perceived authority. So in this particular case, the, head, uh, the subject line says, Airport employees spill travel secrets you probably don't know. And we can reasonably assume that if you're an airport employee, you probably do have an angle on, on travel, particularly if you're a flight attendant or, or a pilot. Um, so that, you know, that does give them some credibility. But the uniform, the uniform is something that we just automatically cede credibility to. When someone is in uniform, we're like, oh, wow, they must know what they're talking about. It's like when, uh, when an actor is on TV and he says, uh, you know, I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV, so therefore you should. And he's got his white coat and his stethoscope. There was actually a reporter who, who did something very interesting. He dressed up like a bank guard, put a sign on an ATM that said that the ATM was broken and that people should give their money to the guard, and then stood there. And people came in, read the sign, looked at him in his uniform, and handed him money. Just handed him money. The, he was the perceived authority. He was standing there. He had the uniform on. So it's perceived authority as well as real authority. And the other people that we cede authority to are celebrities. So this is Katy Perry. She's an actress. She's not a chemist. She's not a doctor. But she's talking about acne medicine. And she says proactive is the best. And we believe her because she's you know, in front of the camera all the time. And, and we like her. And we're like, OK, yeah, she must, be a, she must be an authority on this. So what you want to do is invoke perceived experts. If you want to bubble to the top of, of the uh, competitors list, invoke perceived experts. Our eighth human behavior hack is the one thing to say to increase response. Now, you might be thinking, gee, Nancy, there's kind of a lot of us here in this room, and we sell all kinds of different things, you know, products and services, B2B, B2C. Is there really one thing, one thing that we can all say that's going to increase response? 
And the answer is yes, there is. What you need to do if you want to increase the likelihood someone will do what you're asking them to is give them the reason why. Give them the reason why you're asking them to do what you want them to do. Ellen Langer is a Harvard University uh, researcher, and she conducted an experiment that, that really kind of blew this out and proved it. She actually identified the word because as a compliance trigger while she was doing this. So this is what Langer did. There were a bunch of people lined up to use a photocopier. She sent someone to the head of the line, and that person said, uh, excuse me, do you mind if I cut in front of you? Well, 60% of the people said, sure, you can cut in front, which I think is kind of a high number, isn't it? But anyway, 60% say, sure, you can cut in front. Langer repeats the experiment a second time. Send someone to the head of the line, but this time they say, excuse me, can I cut in front of you because I'm in a hurry and I have some copies to make? Well, here, 94 say, sure, you can cut in front of me. And as I tell you this, you're, you're probably thinking, well, Nancy, they said you, they were in a hurry, right? Langer repeats the experiment a third and final time. Send someone to the head of the line. They say, excuse me, uh, can I cut in front of you because I have some copies to make? 93% say yes. So 94% to 93%, statistically insignificant. Same high, high number. Now think about it. Everybody was standing in that line because they had some copies to make, right? They weren't standing at the photocopier because they wanted a coffee. Dr. Langer identified the word because as a compliance trigger. When we see or hear the word because, we start to act like little bobbleheads. We just start to nod up and down and say yes. We agree without fully processing what comes next. We assume that whatever comes next is a good, logical, rational reason. So give people the reason why, and that word, that magical word because, can be very, very powerful for us in our email marketing. So here, this is an email that I received from a headhunter who was trying to place a candidate. I hadn't called the headhunter and said we had an opening. We hadn't advertised an opening. But she blunted that by leading off with, because we expect your organization is always on the lookout for fine candidates, we want to present one. So that word because is, oh, right, of course, naturally, kind of you know, made me accept it. Here we've got Smith and Walensky, and they're just having a good time. They say, hey, $10 burger bash, because April is taxing enough. Now, you don't have to use the word because to provide the reason why. Here, City was saying, we know your days are hectic, so we enhance citycards.com. Or here, ProFlowers said, Nancy, you're officially running out of time. You have only three days left if you want your flowers delivered by Mother's Day. But they're giving me a reason to act now. They're giving me the reason why I should do what they want me to do. So legitimize your request with a reason. Legitimize your request with a reason. All right, our ninth hack is the journalist secret that boosts email readership. So anyone, anyone go to journalism school like I did? I'm seeing some hands go up. Excellent, excellent, OK. So you can vouch for me when I say that in journalism school, one of the things they teach you is the five W's and the one H. The five W's and the one H. The five W's and the one H are who, what, where, when, why, and how. And in journalism school, they say, start off your stories by answering these questions. You want to do that because those are the questions people want answered. And if you, if you start your story that way, people will read the story. So don't save that stuff for down in the bottom. Lead with it. That's what people are interested in. George Lowenstein is a neuroeconomist. And he coined the phrase information gap theory. And what he found was if there is a gap between what you know and what you want to know, you will take action to close the gap. If there's a gap between what you know and what you want to know, you will take action to close the gap. And what better way to point out that there's a gap in what people know than to use the five W's and the one H? And we're also going to get to numbers and lists in just a second. But a great way to use the five W's and the one H is in your subject lines. Who doesn't want to make their marketing easier? What do 90% of your audience have in common? Where to get good headlines? When it's OK for your brand to be risque and misspell risque? Why an online marketing suite is a game changer. How to guarantee a decision maker meeting when selling to the government. So who, what, where, when, why, how. Those are magic words for subject lines because it, it gets people to think, gosh, I don't know the answer. I'm going to take action to find out the answer. I'm going to open this email. I'm going to consume the information. I'm going to download the white paper. I'm going to go to the website, whatever it is. Those are great power words to use. Now we talk about numbers. And numbers are excellent for a few different reasons. Numbers stand out in a sea of letters. So if you have, have the opportunity to use numbers, do. They stand out in a sea of letters, and people notice things that stand out. We're going to get to that in just a second. There are also another couple of reasons. Numbers promise ease and order. And the human brain craves ease and order. The human brain craves ease and order, and numbers promise that. So if you're going to use, if you have the opportunity to use numbers, do. And use the actual numerals. Don't, don't spell them out. Harvard University ran a study, and they found that odd numbers are perceived as more credible 
than even numbers, because they seem a little bit more exact, that maybe some more thought was put into them, and so they seem more legitimate. The Journal of Consumer Research published a study, and they found that 10, and multiples of 10, do particularly well. And the reason is, we probably grew up counting on our, our fingers, right? So 10 and multiples of 10 are very familiar to us. They're what social scientists refer to as cognitively fluent. They're easier for us to think about. And here's the wonderful thing about something that's cognitively fluent, something that's easy to think about. We believe it more. We judge it to be more truthful and more accurate. And we feel more confident in our ability to make a decision about it. So numbers can be very, very powerful. Numbers are our friends. All right. Offer to fill an information gap. That is the action takeaway from this. Offer to fill that information gap. Who, what, where, when, why, how. If you have the opportunity to use numbers, do. Because they offer concrete order, ease, and concrete order, concrete ease, and concrete information. Our tenth and final human behavior hack is which days are best for success. And I'm not going to say, like, oh, don't email on Mondays because people's inboxes are crowded, or experiment with the weekends because people are still tethered to their devices and checking. There are a lot of other studies out there for that. My answer to which days are the best for success are holidays and special occasions. And it's because of something known as the von Restorff effect. And the von Restorff effect explains that people notice and remember things that stand out. We notice things that, that stick out. It's the von Restorff effect. So if you think about it, most days are pretty much like most other days. Every day is kind of the same day in, day out. But I don't know, every Thursday is like every other Thursday except for Thanksgiving, right? Thanksgiving certainly stands out, if you're here in the States at least. Um, so holidays and special occasions are great to use. So how do we do that? Well, you can key off of some of the major holidays, Christmas, Hanukkah, Easter, Fourth of July. You could drop down to some of the more second string holidays. Here we've got something for National Pi Day. For those of you who are mathematicians in the audience, you'll notice the 31.4% discount, okay, because it's PI, not PIE. Um, you can also go online and you can find a holiday for just about any product or service that you're trying to sell. All right, May 26th happens to be a favorite of mine, National Chardonnay Day. Oh yeah, minutes, minutes away, I'm telling you, minutes away. Um, but you know, if you were in the beverage industry, if you were in the restaurant industry, you could certainly do something around National Chardonnay Day. But even if you weren't, you could say, hey, it's National Chardonnay Day, time to raise a glass and toast our new server line or whatever. You could create some kind of a theme, right? Anyone happen to know what today is? It is National Scrapple Day. <laughs> Apparently a Pennsylvania Dutch delicacy. So yes, today is National Scrapple Day. So okay, so you know, look for holidays. You know, try to uh, you know try to find one that, that works for you. Uh, if you can't find a holiday, think about special occasions. Maybe it's your your customer's birthday or the anniversary of when they made their first purchase or when they joined your loyalty program. If you don't have that data, look inward. Maybe it's your, your uh, company's birthday, your company's anniversary. Maybe it's Founders Day. Do something with that. Or create your own, right? You can create something. Here PTI said, listen, there's Black Friday, there's Cyber Monday, and now there's Orange Tuesday. And I have to assume it's orange because that's their, uh, their um, corporate color. But they created their own. So my name is Nancy Harvard. Is there another Nancy? Are there any more Nancys in the audience? None? Ah, there's one. OK. There, there's one back there. Awesome. This next and final slide is, or final example, I should say, is for us. Look at this. Isn't this great? Happy National Nancy Day. Oh my god. But that, that's like such a cool idea. This was edible arrangements, but they just, you know, they use personalization, but what a creative way to use it. Happy National Nancy Day. I, I couldn't resist opening that. I thought it was fabulous. So, um, so our last hack is piggyback on a holiday or create your own, but that's what's going to make your message stand out. People gravitate towards things that stand out. It's the von Restorff effect. So we have basically just scratched the surface here of decision-making shortcuts that people rely on all the time. They produce these automatic actions. I'm working on an almost complete, uh, have almost finished a white paper that just recaps everything we've talked about and adds in a couple of others that we could not get the time to, uh, to discuss. If anyone would like a copy of that emailed to them, Give me your business card. I'll get it out to you next week. It literally will be done by next week. I'd be happy to send it to you. Um, otherwise, that's about all I have. Thank you so much for spending the last 45 minutes with me. Thank you.